Buongiorno, buongiorno. Good morning. I am the coordinator of this morning's activities. So first of all, I would like to greet all our audience in this wonderful room. I would like to greet the people who are remotely controlled with us, the two speakers who will be with us to debate the topic of public employment. The English term public employment, from my viewpoint as a labor legal expert um, in Italian, uh, should have been perhaps a little bit different. But we know that public employment is related to one of the key words of our festival. So let's leave it as it is. So before giving the floor to our speakers, I would like to spend a few words to focus on this event, which will have a maximum duration of one hour, which will feature two presentations and a debate. One presentation will be in English by Pedro Gomez, and one presentation will be in Italian by Pietro Garibaldi. The topic is public employment, a crucial topic, which is fundamental both today and from a historical perspective, and even more so if we cast the glance to the future. This is a very complex theme, which cannot be simplified, even though we know that in our age we tend to simplify. Why is this a crucial topic? Well, for several reasons. The number one reason is related to the period we're going through, uh, trying to leave the pandemic behind. This theme will be crucial in the next 10, 15 years. It will be crucial in the future. Therefore, we have to think today about the future of public employment. I have heard some optimistic words by Minister Brunetta yesterday and other guests of the festival. Well, I believe that we need confidence in the public system, in public employment, in renewed energies. But we must be very careful because we do not want this dynamic to become a mere reaction to the emergency. Uh, an Opel Aegis which has been built in relation to a negotiating thrust by the European Union. So we need to keep our perspective. Well, compared to the past, as I told you before, this is a crucial theme and it is perfectly connected to the three words in the subtitle of our festival companies, community, institutions. Well, I do not want to quote too many people, but let me quote Hopewell, 1840, democracy in the US. If an American citizen has resources, buys an estate, an estate which is full of trees and becomes a pioneer, well, what about the Europeans? A European citizen with resources immediately thinks about public employment. Well, this quotation is very illuminating and unveils how crucial public employment is for democracy. So a very complex topic, and our two speakers today will illustrate part of this complexity, describing their prospects, which are the ones of the labor economy, a complexity which is related to rules, to the macro value and the micro value of this topic, a complexity which is related to several aspects pertaining to the role of political uh, protagonists, uh, to managers that are an important part of public employment and the trade unions that, at least in Italy, play a role in this field, which is sometimes a vindicating role rather than a proposing role. So there are many, many points we can touch upon. I do not want to steal any time away from our speakers, who certainly have more interesting things to say than I do. So I would like to proceed with Pietro, Pedro Gomez, who will speak first, who is remotely connected with us. Hi, Pedro. Pedro comes from the Purbeck University in London, and he has written a book for an English publisher, Friday is the New Saturday. Well, Pedro, you have the floor. 
good morning, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for the the, the invitation. Um, it's uh, a pleasure to be here, and I'll be talking about public employment. And as you mentioned, public employment is very important for our economies and for society for various reasons. So first, it's important from a labor market perspective. Um, in OECD countries, uh, on average, 18% of total employment uh, is in the public sector. It's also important in the budget. So the majority of what economists call government consumption expenditures, the contribution of government to GDP, the majority is with a public sector wage bill. Now, uh, public sector workers are also the face of the public sector. So they are the frontline workers that provide uh, education, law and order, uh, and health to some extent. It's also important in the political arena, a key issue in electoral campaigns, and both in the, in the previous euro area crisis, the debate on austerity was largely linked to the role of public employment and wages. And as you mentioned today, um, the COVID pandemic has again put focus on, on the one hand, the importance of having a modern public sector with a qualified workforce that can deal with this unpredictable crisis, but the aftermath with high levels of debt also put emphasis on the costs of um, this, this workforce. Now, when we come to the public debate on public employment, it's vibrant, but it's often based on perceptions rather than facts and um, often is, is reduced to a sterile confrontation. So some so supporters of austerity that say, oh, uh, it's a bunch of lazy bureaucrats to be cut, usually have a very Kafkian view of the, uh, of the government. And on the other side of the barricade, supporters of public spending that say public sector need generous wages to deliver high quality service, usually with a more Weberian positive view of, uh, of the government. Now, my, uh, we approach this from an academic perspective. And when we go to the economics uh, research, the economics literature, it was there was a very large interest in the 1970s and 80s. And this accompanied the rise of public employment that happened since the Second World War and peaked in the in the 1980s. The, the increase in the, in the weight of the government and increasing the weight of public uh, public employment. But it diminished in the following decades. And just to give you an example, in between 2000 and 2010, uh, in the NBR, which is a club of academic economists, uh, American economists, only two out of 10,000 papers mentioned public employment in their title or abstract. Now, since the euro area crisis, there's been a new wave of research um, focusing on the labor market effects of public sector employment and, and wages. So myself, I've been working on this for 15 years. And what I find fascinating is exactly what you mentioned, the complexity of public employment. And the complexity um, arises because it lies in the inter intersection of different economic fields, from macroeconomics of labor markets, macroeconomics of fiscal policy, political economy, public economics, to more micro level fields like applied labor economics, personal economics of the government or public administration. So these uh, illustrate the two angles in which you can uh, approach the, or study public employment, a more macro perspective, a top-down perspective, or a more micro human resource perspective, bottom, bottom up. Our own research, uh, Pietro and I, we uh, approach it from a macroeconomic angle, so a top-down. So we think that sound macroeconomic policies on public employment and wages can create the right set of conditions to sustain effective uh, microeconomic human resource practice. But we think that even the best HR departments uh, would struggle if the right macro environment, uh, if the macro environment is not, uh, is not right. So when we go, uh, we, the, the title is public employment, but uh, it should be really public employment and wages. So when we go to a uh, public sector labor market, there's always two dimensions. And this is the first point I want to come across. There is these two dimensions, employment and wages, quantities or prices, so that the head count and the compensation. So uh, let me uh, explain you, guide you through this graph on the x-axis we have government employment uh, as a fraction of uh, private sector employment in relation to private sector. 
Uh, so the headcount, the number of workers. And on the y-axis, we have government wage bill, how much the government spends with these uh, workers relative to the private sector wage bill. And this is, each dot is one OECD country for 2008. And there's three facts I want to highlight. The first one is that uh, countries have very different levels of public, uh, of government or public, um, uh, in this particular uh, data is government employment, which is a slightly more restrictive version of public sector employment. But their uh, countries have uh, various levels of public employment. Uh, some uh, about 10% of the workforce and some countries, namely Nordic and Scandinavian countries that have uh, more than 30% of public employment. So it varies a lot across countries. The second point is that naturally, the more workers you hire, the higher is the wage bill, the, the how much you have to pay in relation uh, to the private sector. And this is highlighted by this black uh, line that tells us that on average, when you hire more workers, you have to pay more, the wage bill is larger. But what's striking about this uh, figure is that there were six countries in 2008, uh, Greece, Cyprus, Italy, Ireland, Portugal, and Spain, that it's not that they had particularly high levels of government of government employment when compared to other countries, but the wage bill relative to the number of workers that they hired was very, very, very high. So there is the, the issue of uh, wages and compensation more than employment. And these six countries were the ones that just one year after were in the center of the euro area crisis for their poor public finance and the sclerotic uh, labor markets. So this is the first point, these two dimensions, employment and wages. So let us think what, what economists can tell about each one of them. So can economists tell us what is the right number of uh, public sector workers? And the answer is no, we cannot. Because at the source, at the, at the origin of the decision of uh, how many workers to hire, lies a more fundamental decision about the scope of the public sector. What goods and services do we want the public sector to provide? Do we want them to provide primary, secondary, tertiary education, health care, elderly care, child care? And this is uh, to, it's a, a choice of society. So it's a, a, a society's choice made through pol uh, uh, politics, through political process. And different countries would give different answers. Norway would give a different answer than the US. Now, economists can help a little bit. There is a further second uh, decision is whether uh, besides the, the, the type of services the government wants to provide, whether the government wants to provide them directly or they want to outsource to the private sector. Okay. Now, economists, so this is a really a fundamental uh, behind uh, hiring workers, it's to produce services. So uh, a lot of the questions should be, um, that's the, the, the original question. Now economists do provide um, or find other situations in which governments can use public employment. So Keynes famous metaphor of hiring public sector workers to overcome demand externality. So we, when we are in the uh, recession, Musgrave, another influential economist, um, uh, didn't didn't uh, uh, think that was uh, the best use of public employment, but he thought it could be used as a targeted policy to overcome structural problems. So if there are regions, for instance, that have been affected by globalization and competition from imports, um, then the government can use public employment to minimize the, the side effects. Uh, Alberto Alessina, an uh, uh, influential Italian economist, uh, mentioned about redistribution, and obviously there are budgetary considerations. Now, uh, economists also point out that in practice, there are also other less benevolent reasons or uh, you, that uh, for the use of public employment. So uh, it's been documented that it's been used to promote interests of politicians or civil servants for rent seeking, so to satisfy unions or political groups or to win, to win elections. But remember at the source of the decision is really what services, goods and services do we want the governments to provide. Now, when it comes to public wages, it's a different issue. It's not a matter of preferences of society. So if we think about the public sector as another sector in the economy, 
uh, different, uh, if it was the, the private sector, the, the wage in the private sector is an allocative mechanism. So what does this mean? Uh, it uh, adjusted, adjusts to market forces. So you have Adam Smith in visible hand adjusting um, the wages to forces of, of demand and supply. So if you think about, you have this perspective about public sector wages, uh, they should be aligned with the wages in the rest of the economy, with the private sector wages. They shouldn't be the same if there are other characteristics of the job um, that make it more uh, pleasant or less pleasant. Uh, but in general, they should be aligned with the wages in the rest of the economy, so in the private sector. Now, in practice, Adam Smith's invisible hand loses its touch in the public sector. And in, in practice, the, uh, the public sector wages are not an allocative mechanism, and they don't resp respond as much to market forces. They are more used as a policy variable. So it's been documented that uh, the, uh, the public sector wages respond to the tightness of the budget. It's affected by unions and the powers of civil servants. It's used to redistribute resources uh, and to win elections. So I want to give you an example. In 2009, in Portugal, there was uh, a year of crisis, but three elections. So public sector workers got an increase of 3% uh, in nominal terms. The following year, because of budgetary problems, there were wage cuts, 10% for the highest earners and zero at the bottom. So from one year, to the other, some public sector workers got an increase of 3%, some public sector workers got a decrease of 7% without any change in the workforce composition, in their job description, or uh, in, the, the product, in their productivity. Now, even when the government doesn't uh, have an active wage policy just by inertia, so if it doesn't respond fast enough to developments in the private sector, it can generate this misalignment between public wages and private sector wages. Uh, and this misalignment, it's estimated by economists what we call public sector wage premium. So this is not just uh, a comparison of the average wage in the two sectors. This is controlling for observable characteristics. So uh, think about uh, two metaphorical brothers in the same occupation with the same education, same age, working in two different sectors. Um, and uh, this is from a paper by Luis Christofidis and Maria Michaels for uh, European countries. And they find this, that the, the, the wages are in general not aligned. So there are some countries who uh, the public sector pays less than the private for equivalent workers, but the majority, the public sector wage premium is positive. Here, Italy would come in the middle of the table in 2008 with a, a premium of about 8% uh, uh, more. Now, we should be very careful when we uh, look at this uh, at at uh, at a uh, figure like this for two reasons. First is when we estimate the public sector wage premium, we have to go to micro data that usually comes three years uh, later. Then there is the publication legs. So uh, this refers to the year two thousand and eight, and the picture today, I'm sure, it's very different from the, the year 2008. And things uh, in the public sector wage premium can change dramatically and they can change very quickly. So we should be very careful uh, when inferring about what we think the conditions are now from uh, these papers that estimate the public sector wage premium. The second point is that on average, nothing is an average. So public sector employment is very heterogeneous along uh, various dimensions, in particular, education, region, age, and gender. So we should be very, very careful when we interpret uh, uh, these uh, averages of pay, because it means very different uh, things for different people. So let me just illustrate with the heterogeneity by education. You have here, it's for the US, but pretty much in every country is the same. The, the, the US government hires very few workers with lower qualifications and it hires one third of all workers with a PhD or a master degree. But when we go to pay, actually it's workers with lower qualification that have a higher wage premium. Um, and it's workers with the, the, the more qualifications that have the very low and very often a, a, negative, a negative premium of working in the public sector.
So this misalignment of wages also occurs within the public sector for different types of workers. Um, now let me give you a uh, let me give you an example of uh, for for Italy. Um, this uh, is data from the structure of earnings survey for 2014. This is going. We are going to very fine occupation categories and and see the average wage. So domestic, hotel, and office cleaners and helpers in the private sector they earn 1,460 euros. In the public sector they earn on average 10%, uh, 9% uh, more. And in the private sector they work five more weekly hours. When we go to secretaries and clerks, the, the pay uh, seems more, uh, more equal, although in the private sector, they still work six more hours. When we go to top occupations, we have the reverse. We have uh, the private sector paying 5,000 euros and the public sector paying 3,000 euros. Um, so you can have the misalignment working going both ways for different types of workers. Now, what's the problem? What's the problem of these wage misalignments? So I'm going to uh, read you a quote from a newspaper article on uh, uh, the, the, uh, the job opening in the Bank of Italy in 2017 that highlights many of the problems of this wage misalignment. So Italy's chronic unemployment problem has been thrown into sharp relief after 85,000 people applied for 30 jobs at the bank. The work is not glamorous. One duty is feeding cash into machines that can distinguish banknotes that are counterfeit or so worn out they should no longer be in circulation. The Bank of Italy whittled down the applicants to a shortlist of 8,000, all of them first-class graduates with solid academic record behind them. They will have to sit a grueling examination in which they will be tested on statistics, mathematics, economics, and English. The high level of interest was a reflection of the state of the economy, but also of the Italian obsession of securing a permanent job. So th this quote highlights some of the problems of uh, very high uh, compensation of public sector jobs. The first one is it generates long queues uh, for these jobs. 85,000 people applying to 30 jobs means that they are not applying to the private sector. There is lower job creation in the private sector as a, a response, and it generates higher unemployment. They'll just be queuing, waiting to get uh, to trying to get in the public sector. Additionally, it points out to another problem, which is underemployment in the public sector. These, uh, especially when jobs, um, more unskilled jobs pay too well, they will attract people that are more qualified uh, to the job. And uh, because of the uh, selection procedure based, based on ranking, they will be the ones that get the job. So these people will be the best person for the job, but they won't be the right person for the job. The public sector will be wasting skills of people that could be working either in the private sector or creating companies. So it, uh, underemployment is more perversive in the public sector. It also encourages the use of uh, political and personal connections to try to jump the queue. Nepotism in the public sector, usually it's associated with public employment, but uh, in my own research, we found that it's more a symptom of this imbalance between the public and private sector. When private se public sector jobs, they have high wages, more job security and other benefits, they are so attractive that it, they encourage the use of uh, political and, and personal connections to try to, to jump and, and, and get this, uh, you know, passing by these other 85,000 people that want the job. Generates lower entrepreneurship rates in the private sector. And also um, a recent paper that Pietro and I have just published together with Teptida uh, Sokrasov from, from TEMA, um, it alters the types of workers the government hires. So if you think you are a head of a department and you have a budget and you decide which workers you want to hire, if uh, especially at the very bottom of the distribution, more uh, low skill positions, they are relatively very expensive, then no one would want to hire, open these positions and they prefer to open positions at a higher level that are relatively cheaper. So it alters the skill mix of the government and obviously generates higher spending. Now, what the point I want we want to come across is that uh, we, we think that the problem in many countries for most workers is uh, at the top end, so too, uh, too high wages, but we should be very careful 
uh, about the opposite problem. When wages are too low, then it generates recruitment problems and it can jeopardize production and it generates an inefficient skill mix. So we should be very, uh, very careful for different types of workers, try to find the right balance between the two. Now, uh, and this is my, my final slide, is uh, it's important to, to pass this message that what's important is the alignment of the total compensation of the jobs. So it's not an al a perfect alignment of the wages with the private sector wage, it's alignment of compensation. So there are other benefits that have been documented in the literature of the public sector that offer, uh, that are valued by workers. So these are lower hours, as we've we've seen, uh, but also more amenable hours. So it's actually better work-life balance, more job security uh, that's very valuable, especially in countries with high unemployment, but that's also better pension schemes or better healthcare uh, benefits uh, important, for instance, in the US. So all of these uh, characteristics of public sector jobs should be valued and it should be reflected into lower relative pay. So public sector, if it offers more job security, then the pay should be lower than the private sector. So you can maintain the compensation, that the same package. So when a worker is deciding, do I want a public sector job or a private sector job, they would select based on other characteristics, namely pro-social uh, pro motivation um, or, or, uh, or altruism. Uh, but the, the, the two packages would be um, would have the similar value. Now, it's, uh, it's hard to know. Uh, it's not necessarily easy to know when is the wage too high or too low, but there is one uh, statistic that we can use uh, to find out which is the cues for public sector jobs. If an application has a thousand applicants that are suitable, it probably means that the wage is too high. If you open a vacancy and you don't find suitable candidates, then it means um, it's it's too low. So I'll, I'll stop now, and Pietro will take over, trying to um, think about the policy proposals um, that that arise from this research. Thank you. Bene, grazie. Buongiorno. Thank you so much, uh, Pedro, for this uh, introduction. So the second part of the presentation is about policy proposals in order to manage this issue. As Pedro said, and as was said during the introduction, it is a very complex topic. But in order to make a proposal, you have to simplify things. You have to have a clear bottom line and then work on it and see whether it can be applied uh, to different countries. Uh, now, the uh, heart of the proposal is that uh, quantity is uh, a variable which uh, should be a political variable, why wages uh, should not. Uh, basically, we should have uh, maximum flexibility when choosing uh, employment and when choosing how many people to have uh, in the public sector. But uh, the uh, fixation of public uh, wages uh, should be removed from the political uh, arena and determined uh, in a different way, which I'm going to describe. And the goal should be a better, but not perfect uh, alignment uh, between uh, public wages uh, and uh, private wages. And this is a very topical uh, issue because uh, this morning uh, in the paper there is the news about uh, 30,000 recruitments uh, in the uh, public sector in Italy. And uh, uh, this, this is good, of course. Uh, and it's uh, part uh, of uh, a reform, a reform which has two steps. Uh, step one is to set a pay schedule and a progression structure in all jobs uh, of the public sector. And the step two is a yearly or uh, a yearly decision about wage growth uh, How can we get to this uh, reform in two steps? 
chiaro bilanciamento tra settori. First of all, we need to have a good balancing of the different sectors. So the benchmark, as you can see in the slides, should be private sector wages, that's a benchmark, by occupation, education, experience and region. Once we have those wages, it is necessary to adjust downwards for hours because, as Pedro showed us, very often uh, people work less or fewer hours in the public sector. Job security differential. In some countries, also in Italy, due to different the, the differences in terms of pensions, premiums, and health care. And of course, this structure must be flexible enough to allow, at micro level, to recognize a premium to those who deserve it. So we need this managerial skill and we need this kind of flexibility. And there is an obvious problem which has come to the foreground right now. Um, in some professions, it is difficult to find an equivalent with the private sector. Think about the military. General Figliuolo in Italy is going through the most difficult task. He's organizing the vaccine distribution all over the country. We do not have an equivalent in the private sector. So we should try to find some similar jobs in the private sector. Something that can be compared with General Filiolo's job is being the manager of logistics, say, of Amazon. And of course, this manager has a much higher wage. This is an indicator that can help us monitor the wages and to keep the queues under control. Because what happened to the Bank of Italy in 2017 is a paradox. You can't have 80,000 people um, trying to obtain a job which is not all that interesting after all. This implies a reduction of public sector wage premium for low educated or young workers or in poorer regions. And we should not be scared by this because the demand for jobs in those areas would probably increase. Uh, in the poorer regions, probably uh, public employment uh, should be increased also because in those areas we have a higher unemployment rate. A reform cannot be made overnight. We cannot think of cutting wages directly because this is not politically feasible and it is not socially desirable. Therefore, it is necessary to have a longer time horizon because Italy is famous to start many things and being unable to fulfill them all. And this must occur not by cutting wages, but by transforming the evolution of the whole wage structure and schedule together with some regional top up. If you worked abroad, say in London in the UK, you probably noticed that they have London allowances there. That is a wage increase for those cities where life is particularly expensive. This could be applied to Milan or Rome in Italy, for instance. And the government should use both hands, so to say, that is on one hand. The government should announce wage growth changes and simultaneously should announce a quantity increase in employment, offering better public services. And then there is also a second step in this reform, which is a yearly wage growth decision.
this should not be a political decision. It should be made by a public commission accounting to the parliament so that we can have a growth rate of public wages, which is similar to that of private wages, to prevent those outliers that we saw in the picture before, predominantly in Southern Europe. And this could be done by the budget office of our parliament, by the fiscal council, uh, referring to the minimum wage commission of the UK, for instance. I mean, there are many possible uh, agencies that could do that and that could check every year or every two years the uh, average increase. And then every five or ten years, it is necessary to reevaluate the base schedule and the progression structure. Which are the advantages of such a reform? Well, first of all, it can maintain parity between the two sectors, private and the public one, in good and bad times. It reduces the scope of the government to huge wages for electoral purposes. And this is a very important point next to the above mentioned parity between the two sectors. During a recession, usually wages decrease in the private sector, but this does not happen in the public sector. Last year, during the pandemic, there was a strike of the public employment in May last year, which was almost embarrassing. The government, and this is an advantage, maintains control of all instruments related with the supply of public goods. It is possible to reduce the tax burden. It is a simple reform, fair and easy to understand, and it could bring some predictability, which is one of the most extravagant variables and irrational variables, like Pedro showed us with the example of Portugal prior to the crisis. Of course, there are four or even more possible objections. Every reform has got objections. Let me focus on these four important objections. The first one pertains to inequality. As we can read in the Middle East report, the uh, economy Nobel Prize winner has written this report showing that the government has a redistributive role, but this does not mean that all economic policy instruments have to be redistributive. The government aims at fighting inequality, and there are different tools to do that. We're talking these days of the fiscal system, of the taxation, of inheritance tax. There are many other regulatory policies, such as a minimum wage, for instance. Public wages do not resolve the problem, but rather amplify it, producing inefficiencies in the labor market. Does it make sense to hire low-skilled workers in the public sector? Because if you reduce the wages, uh, you hire low-skilled workers. Does it make sense? A person with a university degree in physics should actually use machines at the Bank of Italy to check banknotes. Perhaps we should allocate talents in a better way between the public and the private sector. Resorting to low-skilled workers, we could free skilled workers for more complex tasks improving aggregate productivity. And finally, we're deeply convinced that political games and markets, when deciding how to allocate individuals, it is better to resort to market tools. More criticism. We are removing the possibility for politicians to control a useful instrument. Well, if politicians are well-minded and work well, then they would do what we're saying. So our objective is to tie the hands of bad politicians, those that use public wages for 
campaigning purposes. The government would maintain control of all the instruments regarding the supply of public goods or insurance purchases of intermediate goods, investment, employment, transfers, unemployment benefits, I mean, all these instruments would be maintained. Of course, this reduces the importance of unions in the public sector, but it provides a fair deal for public workers. So, in other words, if you are employed in the public sector, you earn more or less what you would earn in the private sector. But are we actually sure that private wages are a good benchmark? that public wages are efficiently defined. What if they're not efficient? And we know that in the private sector there are problems, then we must use the tools to correct this. So this is our idea. Uh, we know that the problem is very, very complex. One thing is our policy variables wages should not be a policy variable. And the goal is that of having a better, if not perfect, alignment of public wages with the private sector. And this can be done via a two-step reform. Number, step number one, set a pay schedule. Step number two, yearly wage growth decision. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pietro Garibaldi and Pedro Gomez. I believe that we have enjoyed both our speakers, and we have a little bit of time for questions. So let's now open the debate. Are there any questions from the audience? Please, just raise your hand if you want to ask a question, and then use the microphone on your right. So if you need to ask a question, please raise your hand, stand up, move to the microphone and ask your question. In the meantime, while you're thinking about your questions, oops, there is already a question. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. The topic is so complex that I would like to share a couple of thoughts with you. These are dramatic thoughts considering the past year. Rigid wages in the public sector. There are some sectors, some areas in the public sector where extra hours are allowed. So when we talk of the public contract in these sectors, you also have to approach the complexity of the structure of wages, the composition of wages. I mean, teachers are not allowed to work extra hours. Other public employees are allowed to do that. Teachers are not allowed to do extra hours, but they can give private lessons. I'm not talking about the fact that this is not going to be part of the text declaration. However, there are other areas with individuals with the medium to low qualification where extra hours are not allowed in the public sector, but they are allowed in the private sector. So when Pedro Gomez was making the comparison of wages and numbers of hours uh, that was based on the contract, but not on what really happens in real life. In some areas of the public sector, on top of that, 
Employees are not only forbidden from working extra hours, but some of them even have 40 or 50 days of paid holidays. Conversely, in the private sector, the people I know can have one week of holidays, continued holidays, and in peak times, they may enjoy a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday holiday. In other words, their contract holidays must be concentrated over these short periods of three days. I mean, on top of that, there's the issue of selection in the public sector who selects people. I mean, in the public sector, we have vendors and how do they actually select the individuals who passes these exams, which are usually at the base? Any other question? Please uh, come over to the microphone. Per non rimanere troppo in silenzio, se prego. Well, well, I worked in the public sector as a teacher. Now I'm uh, on a pension. And I would like to note uh, that the work should not be quantified uh, in, uh, uh, based on hours uh, uh, that you spend at school. You have to take into consideration also the hours that at school, at, how, at home you, you spend in order to uh, prepare the lessons, uh, correct uh, the exercises, uh, and prepare uh, for example, uh, documents, uh, because there is a lot of uh, uh, bureaucracy to uh, take care of. And this uh, type uh, of work uh, has never been uh, uh, valued. Uh, so teachers uh, spend uh, many hours uh, at home uh, working uh, on uh, the school lessons. And this is not the case uh, in other situations, uh, because I think that very few people bring their uh, job home, so to say. So all teachers have to correct uh, exercises, uh, also uh, art uh, uh, teachers. Uh, I was a teacher of Italian and literature, and I had uh, packs and packs of exercises to correct at home. Thank you. I'm sorry, people are speaking out of the microphone. We cannot hear. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, very lively debate. Uh, let's try and uh, give an answer. Just a couple of comments, uh, and then perhaps uh, Pedro will also answer. Well, it's true. Quantity hasn't only to do with uh, people, but also the number of hours. Uh, and uh, when we go into the details uh, uh, of the contract, uh, uh, extra hours, uh, overtime uh, is a very um, sensitive issue, and things change uh, between the public and the private sector. However, there is a very topical example that I'd like to mention. 
At the start uh, of uh, his uh, term in office, uh, President uh, Draghi proposed uh, to continue the school year beyond June uh, and go to school also in June and July in order to make up for the time uh, uh, lost. Uh, so a change in the uh, working schedule and the distribution of the workload also paid uh, more. And there has been a strong opposition. And I'm sorry for that uh, personally. And this is something that couldn't have happened in the private sector, because uh, if uh, the employer uh, asked uh, for a change uh, because of the pandemics or others, uh, well, uh, uh, people would uh, uh, accept that. Uh, and then the second comment, uh, it's true that uh, jobs are very specific. Every job is different from the other. It's true that a teacher brings home a lot of work as compared to a worker who works uh, in the uh, municipality, for example. So. We need to have uh, different uh, benchmarks, uh, and the wages uh, should uh, reflect uh, uh, those uh, differences. Uh, Pedro, do you have anything to say? Could you listen to the uh, comments? Uh, would you like to add anything? Yes, so um, I, I, I sympathize very much with the, uh, the comments of, of the teacher. So my, my, myself, I'm a university lecturer. My wife is a doctor at the National Health System. My mother was also a head school in a, um, the head teacher in a primary school, and my father worked in the public sector. So I come from a uh, family. Everyone worked in the in the in the public sector, and I, I I do understand because myself I also bring a lot of uh, work home. And but I think you you both mentioned a very important point, which is um, the the difference between what's written in the contract. Uh, and what's specified in the contract and what happens in practice. And uh, for a matter of the wage, it's really not so much what, what the, the specified in the contract. It's actually, it's actually um, what happens in practice. And uh, I can tell you uh, two. So you mentioned the ones of, about uh, hours. And um, I think it's, uh, it, yeah, in practice, it's, it can happen both, both ways. Now you have the example of the teacher that might bring uh, uh, work home and work more hours than it's in the contract. And you also might have uh, the same happening in the private sector in other uh, occupations. Um, so this is uh, uh, the, the important uh, um, part is, you know, can we get data? And usually the data that we have through surveys uh, is uh, relates to actual hours worked rather than the ones. So you, you specify both the contract and the hours worked. So we, we can study uh, these uh, these differences. One, um, another reason for instance is the, for example, the type of contract you have. In the public sector, there is also uh, a lot of people that have temporary contracts uh, in, the, in the public sector. But what we find uh, when we compare the probability of then being unemployed, if you have a temporary contract in the public sector, you are less likely to be unemployed in the following quarter than if you have a temporary contract in the private sector. So although the, the contracts are the same, in practice, they imply a different uh, job, um, job, job security. So uh, these are, are two, uh, two very, very good points. And what I'm saying is that we should base our decision on what happens in practice. And for that, we have to, uh, to understand well uh, the, the 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 different the, the different jobs and how they are different from what the contract specifies. Grazie, Pedro. E se non vedo altre, prego. Thank you, Pedro. So, a very short question, please. Good morning. I'll uh, make reference to the example of the Bank of Italy that was mentioned uh, for that humble job uh, which uh, required a lot of applications. Uh, well, I said, okay, that's the Bank of Italy. 
um, I don't know what the wage was for that job, but I can imagine that uh, at the Bank of Italy, such a job is uh, paid much more than it would be paid in a small municipality. So a similar job in a municipality that is to count the money, well, would have uh, a salary, a, a, a wage, uh, which would be very, very low. And uh, it wouldn't uh, uh, attract uh, 8,000 people queuing up for that job. And the same uh, could uh, happen if uh, there were a competition for, uh, a, um, for example, a, a domestic worker at uh, Montecitorio, for example, at the um, um, president's uh, palace, uh, for example. So it depends. So in Italy, the in the public sector, wages uh, are higher. Uh, so, we should also uh, consider the heterogeneity of the wages in the public sector. And this heterogeneity depends not only on uh, some macro uh, situations, but also on the prestige that some institutions uh, have. So there are public institutions uh, which pay more for the same job. So uh, given the same job, if you work in a muni small municipality, you will have uh, uh, a lower uh, wage uh, as compared to the same person working in a ministry, for example. Well, perhaps uh, uh, not a big difference, uh, but a certain level of uh, heterogeneity. And then uh, let's consider small municipalities uh, where uh, normal uh, clerks uh, have uh, uh, particular uh, jobs, and they have to take decisions, important decisions, um, which involve uh, spending uh, uh, public money, something that uh, in other uh, public administrations uh, uh, should would be done by uh, top managers. Uh, so there is also this type of heterogeneity which should uh, be taken into consideration when you make proposals. Uh, because uh, there are uh, clerks in uh, small uh, municipalities uh, who have to take important decisions, uh, uh, and nevertheless, they are not paid uh, appropriately, and they are paid less uh, than uh, uh, top managers uh, taking those decisions uh, in big uh, public institutions. So is it possible to take into consideration also that type of heterogeneity? So going back to the Bank of Italy, you don't, of course, uh, uh, you will not have uh, a physic, uh, uh, a graduate in physics uh, going uh, to um, uh, count the money at uh, Banca d'Italia. That's true. But uh, we should avoid uh, the, the situation of having uh, overqualified uh, people going uh, to uh, apply for such uh, low-skilled uh, jobs. Thank you. Pietro, Pedro, sorry, Pietro. Well, that's a paradox uh, more, than an, uh, more than an example, and it, it's particularly dramatic. Uh, the difference uh, highlighted by Pedro is true at all levels of the government, a central level, regional level, and local level. Uh, so it is a situation which is uh, replicated uh, at all levels of government. So the fact that at the Bank of Italy uh, the jobs uh, are uh, highly paid, uh, well, there is no reason uh, for that. Uh, if those 80,000 people like to work uh, for the Bank of Italy, OK. But uh, why should the wage be so high, uh, given also the fact that the job is uh, secure? So uh, lastly, it is not true that the public sector has a little human capital, because our research work shows that in all countries, the public sector recruits 
many more um, highly skilled uh, uh, workers uh, um, as compared to the um, to other sectors. Uh, Pedro, would you like to add anything to this? Yes. So I I, um, I think it's it's uh, a, a point. It, it highlights this heterogeneity that I mentioned at the education level. It also exists at the regional level, and it's this. Um, the, the fact that there are some workers who are underpaid in the public sector and there are other workers who are uh, overpaid. And that's what makes the discussion so complicated because you can always come up with specific examples uh, uh, one way or the other. And this is a consequence of generally not thinking much about how much we pay uh, and not thinking much how much we should pay. When it comes um, to uh, to different uh, at the regional level, we also find uh, th there exists this heterogeneity, but it's it's actually tends to be the public sector wage premium is higher in uh, uh, in general poorer regions. So in in Italy, the public sector premium is higher in the south and in the islands, because if you think about just someone working in the in the council or in the municipality. Uh, there is uh, the, the the idea of equal pay for equal workers means that worker in Milan in the same position as in Naples earn the same, but earning a thousand euros in Milan is not earning it's not the same as earning a thousand euros in uh, in Naples. Uh, having said that, you you are right. Uh, you, you what you point that there are people who need to make important decisions, and they are not really uh, well paid. Well, this because we are thinking about some people in the very in the very top, and uh, what what is important is along the distribution we have to have a, a discussion that shouldn't uh, have any any complexes, um, and it shouldn't be this idea that I, we should either cut wages to everyone or increase wages to everyone. One. We just have to think carefully uh, about how to, to to set the wages and how to incorporate all these other factors and um, of the different characteristics into pay. And um, I think as a, a situation now where societies are, are so polarized, it's 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 a conversation that it's, it's hard to have, but it's uh, it's it's very important if we want to improve the the, the services um, in the in the public sector. Grazie, grazie Pedro. Io penso che abbiamo Thank you very much Pedro. I believe that our time is over and I would like to conclude by saying the following trying to summarize the different prospects and evaluations that have emerged in this debate. Pietro Garibaldi has emphasized redistribution through public wages is not the only way. And I believe that in a post-pandemic a period, it is necessary to think about this. The proposal that has been made aims at widening our perspective and changing it. So today's debate has unveiled the complexity of this topic and its significance as well. So thank you very much to the audience for participating also in the debate. And I would like to thank the festival for organizing all this. Thank you very much, Pietro Garibaldi. Thank you very much, Pietro Gomez. And enjoy the rest of the festival. <laughs>